Panasonic launched the first mirrorless camera when it debuted the Lumix G1 back in 2008, and over the years the company has developed an extensive range of Lumix cameras, as well as travel compacts and big zoom bridge cameras. In this guide we'll round up the best Panasonic cameras for what you want to film or photograph. The G9 inherits the 20.3 MP Micro Four Thirds sensor from the GH5, and this has no optical low-pass filter. The image processing engine is the same as the GH5s, but Panasonic says the processing itself has been improved. It also has the same kind of high-resolution capture mode introduced by Olympus, which takes a sequence of images with a tiny shift in the sensor position for each, before combining them into a single 80 MP image. Panasonic says the G9 has the world's fastest AF speeds for mirrorless cameras, with a focus time of just 0.04 seconds with the Leica DG Vario Elmeri 12-60mm f 2.8-4.0 ASPH. It uses Panasonic's depth from defocus autofocus technology and there's a joystick on the back of the camera for moving the focus point around the frame. At 380 shots per charge, battery life is about average for a mirrorless camera, but there's an optional BG G9 battery grip for extended shooting and better handling with longer telephoto lenses. The Panasonic Lumix G9 is pretty big for a micro four-thirds mirrorless camera, but that's no bad thing because it gives it better handling with larger lenses like constant aperture zooms or telephotos. It's about the same size as a mid-range enthusiast DSLR. The smaller sensor, however, does mean that the lenses for this camera are correspondingly smaller and lighter than their DSLR-specific counterparts. The G9 might not be any smaller than a DSLR, but your kit bag is still likely to be a good deal lighter. At the top of the camera, a separate still shutter and video record button offer easy access to both shooting modes. A control wheel by the shutter and a second wheel at the back, near the thumb rest, make it easy to adjust aperture and shutter speed without taking your eye from the viewfinder. In addition, a shortcut button for white balance, ISO and exposure compensation helps to expand the physical controls for hands-on, eyes-off operation. The traditional mode dial along with a dial for burst mode, timer, post-focus, and 6K photo modes also sit on top, along with the first of five customizable function buttons. The GH5 has both an electronic viewfinder and a 3.2-inch LCD. The 3,680K dot viewfinder and the 1,620K dot LCD offer an accurate representation of what's in the frame, with focus peaking to lend a hand in scenarios that require manual focus. The LCD is both touch-sensitive and hinge-mounted, which allows for a wide range of viewing angles, including front-facing, great for selfies or vlogs. To the right of the viewfinder, the GH5 has a number of focus controls. A switch swaps between manual focus, continuous, and single autofocus. That switch circles an autofocus and auto exposure lock button. Next to those focus controls, there is a joystick, a feature not found in the predecessor. The joystick makes it simple and fast to adjust the focal point in the pinpoint autofocus mode. Without it, moving the focus point would be a multi-step process. You can also tap the touchscreen to set your focus point, but with a 225 area autofocus system, the joystick allows for more accuracy. The GH series has always offered superior direct access control, and the GH5 is no different, with plenty of on-camera buttons. The quick menu offers easy access to the settings that the physical dials and buttons don't handle. You can record both full HD and 4K video for as long as you want, there's no time limit, while the Lumix GH5S complies with 4K HDR video with hybrid log gamma mode in photo style. The GH5S also records 4 to 2 colon 210 bit 400 megabits per second all intra and 4K and cinema 4K, and 200 megabits per second all intra and full HD. The Lumix GH5S is also compatible with timecode and slash out, making it easy to synchronize multiple compatible devices when filming, for pain-free post-production editing. A bundled coaxial cable for a BNC terminal connects to the flash sync terminal of the camera, allowing the camera to be used as a timecode generator for other GH5S cameras and professional camcorders. Panasonic has opted to remove the built-in image stabilization system that featured in the GH5. This might seem a bit of an odd decision for such a video-focused camera, but feedback from film crews who use the GH5 revealed that, even when mounted on a professional rig, the sensor is at risk of being shaken around despite being switched off. 
This is because the IS system is designed to float the sensor using a series of electromagnets, and even when the system is switched off the sensor isn't locked in place. With the internal IS system removed, crews are free to use their own gimbals and rigs to steady the camera. The Lumix GH5S also promises to make composition and shooting in poor light that much easier. Live View Boost increases the sensitivity just for live view, while there's also a night mode that features a red interface. Although it's not a twin-gripped camera, the S1 is pretty large, bigger than the Nikon Z6 and Sony A7 III. However, that means there's room for a sturdy grip and bigger controls, which combine to make it feel good in your hand. Front and rear dials, plus a control wheel on the back of the camera and the excellent touchscreen also allow you to adjust settings quickly and easily. With 5,760,000 dots, the OLED electronic viewfinder is the highest resolution viewfinder around. And the view in it is superb until light levels fall. Then it becomes a bit laggy even at either of its frame rates. On the back of the camera the 3.2 inch, 2,100,000 dot screen has a dual tilt mechanism that feels robust. It's useful for video and stills in whichever orientation you shoot, but it can't be flipped for viewing from in front of the camera. Given the high-end status of the S1, it's no surprise to find an extensive menu, but it's arranged reasonably logically. Nevertheless, its habit of sending you back to the last feature you accessed in each tab as you navigate between sections means it takes a while to find features in the early days. You seem to be continually scanning up and down looking for the feature you want. The results from the S1 don't hold any major surprises as they accurately reflect what you see in the EVF and main screen when constant preview is selected in the menu. As we've found before with Panasonic cameras, the standard auto white balance setting is pretty reliable in natural light, but the fine weather setting tends to produce slightly more pleasing results. The S1's 24MP sensor strikes a nice balance between detail level and noise visibility. Noise is controlled well up to around ISO 12800, and the results at ISO 25600 are good on the whole, but it's wise to be a little cautious. The noise reduction can be a bit too enthusiastic in some areas. As usual, the RAW files are better, having more detail but more luminance noise. Though if there is a chink in the S1R's armor it's here. That 9fps frame rate is achieved only with the AF locked on the first frame. With continuous autofocus the frame rate drops to 6fps, and while the S1R also has a 6K photo mode that can capture 18 megapixel images at 30fps, it's not quite the same thing. Panasonic has taken a pretty uncompromising approach to the S1R's build quality, with a magnesium alloy construction and weather sealing that makes it dust and moisture resistant and freeze proof down to minus 10 degrees. It's a pretty substantial camera to pick up and hold and feels even meatier than Nikon Z6 and Z7 models and definitely more substantial than Sony's A7 series. It goes further in a number of respects, though. The electronic viewfinder's resolution is on a whole new level, for a start. It's not just superbly sharp, contrasty and saturated, it's also remarkably lag-free. We're used to electronic displays blurring and smearing with fast camera movements, especially in low light, but Panasonic does seem to have raised the bar here and this perhaps the closest we've yet come to a genuine optical viewfinder look. The screen on the back of the camera deserves some special praise too. Its resolution of 2,100K dots means it's exceptionally sharp, but it also has a clever triaxial tilt mechanism that allows for sideways movement as well as up and down, so this is a tilting screen you can also use with the camera held vertically. The movement is restricted to about 45 degrees, however, it hinges in one direction only and you have to slide a slightly fiddly catch on the side of the screen to release it.